Tonight on Crime Stories. He dressed like a clown to make children laugh. But behind the face paint was a man who tortured and murdered. He was John Wayne Gacy. When this whole thing is over, you might be witnessing one of the most horrible crimes, perhaps, in a century. He claimed to be a loving father. See, I don't believe in hitting, hitting children. But what he did to his young victims was unspeakable. It was terrible. The smell of death was everywhere. How he killed those boys for his own pleasures. How could you, could you forgive me? To the end, John Wayne Gacy proclaimed his innocence. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, because you will have executed somebody that didn't commit the crime. This is Crime Stories. I'm Richard Belzer. Imagine the nightmare. Your child is missing and you don't know what happened. Until one day, a horrifying discovery. Your lost child is found, brutally murdered, and buried in the basement of a man who was addicted to killing. The nightmare comes true not once or twice, but 33 times. The work of a man whose name became synonymous with evil, John Wayne Gacy, one of the most notorious serial killers of all time. Spring 1992, killer John Wayne Gacy tries to rewrite history. When they paint the image that I was this monster who, who picked up like these altar boys along the street and, and swatted them like flies, I said, this is ludicrous. The prison interview came 13 years after Gacy had been convicted of murdering 33 young men and boys from 1972 until 1978. Whether it's, it's Berkowitz, whether it's Bundy, whether it's uh, Williams, uh, Wayne Williams down on Atlanta, or any of the others, or Charlie Manson, see, I, I don't comment about the other cases for the simple fact is that I wasn't there. Do you feel somewhat of a kinship with some no. of these people? No. God, I, ha I hate that when they, they put me in the same club with them. With his execution date just months away, Gacy, then 51, was seeking a new trial. If people don't want to know the truth and the, and the honesty of it, if they want to be convinced they're brainwashed into what they believe, then fine, then go ahead and kill me. But vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, because you will have executed somebody that didn't commit the crime. But the evidence against him was overwhelming. Evidence that didn't come together until December 1978, when a 15-year-old boy disappeared. He was one of a number of boys who had disappeared in the Chicago area. But something about him was different. The boy was Rob Peast, a sophomore in high school who worked part-time at the Nissan Pharmacy in the northwestern suburbs of Chicago. On December 11th, at quitting time, he told his mother he was going to talk to a man about a construction job. But Rob Peast never made it home. His parents finally ended up at the police department to fill out a missing persons report on their youngest son. At the time, the man in charge of the state's attorney's office was Terry Sullivan. One young police officer happened to come up the one morning, and he said, Terry, there's a couple that was here last night reporting their son missing, and um, I think there's something strange to it. I don't believe that he's a runaway. Sullivan agreed. Rob Peast was the consummate good kid, devoted to his family, an honor student who wanted to be an astronaut. There was no reason for him to run away. Something was wrong. Immediately, a search was organized. His parents were devastated. Well, I went to pick up Rob at the drugstore where he works at about 10 to 9. And uh, he says uh, it would take a few minutes that he wanted to talk to a contractor this contractor about a job. And then with that, I started browsing around the store, and I'd never seen him since. For police, the most obvious lead was the contractor Rob had gone to meet. His name was John Gacy. As it turned out, Gacy often hired young boys. 
Two days after Rob disappeared, Sullivan called Gacy into the police station. And he um, basically just said he had no idea what, what we were talking about. He denied even knowing the kid, and uh, in frustration, um, I had said to him that, well, I understand uh, that you don't want to say anything, but we've got evidence uh, th that, in fact, you were seen with him uh, very recently. Soon after that confrontation in mid-December 1978, police began tracking the movements of John Wayne Gacy. Meantime, a simple background check revealed that Gacy had been convicted 10 years earlier in Iowa. The charge was sodomy. The victim, a teenage boy. Gacy was released from the Iowa Men's Reformatory after serving only 18 months. Because of Gacy's record, a 24-hour surveillance was ordered. David Hackmeister, then a six-year veteran of the department and a young father of three, was assigned to the job. I knew that, in fact, they thought that this could be a homicide. They asked me to keep surveillance on the house. It soon became obvious that a concealed surveillance of John Gacy would be impossible. Gacy often drove over 60 through city streets. Over several days, frustration grew as two two-man teams followed Gacy on fruitless journeys throughout metropolitan Chicago. His personality could change in a split second. You know, one, one second we're his best buddy, we're his bodyguards that he's introducing us people to, and the next second we'll go into another bar and we're uh, from the FBI who are harassing him. As the days went on, there was still no sign of Rob Peast. His family posted his picture throughout the neighborhood. Then, a lead. Gacy told the surveillance team that he owned some land up north in Wisconsin. So right away, we're thinking, that's where the body is. Of course, uh, he's feeding us this information, knowing that we're going to follow up on this, just kind of leading us off the track. Work at the state's attorney's office was more productive. The investigators had obtained a search warrant for Gacy's house based on Gacy's sodomy conviction 10 years earlier in Iowa. My hopes, of course, the hopes of the police officers and my fellow state's attorneys was that we would find Rob alive. When police investigators entered Gacy's home, it was fastidiously neat. They collected an assortment of items, handcuffs, garter belts. One officer picked up a photo receipt from Nissan Pharmacy. But of all the items found, one of the most chilling was a class ring. It was quickly learned that the ring belonged to a recent high school graduate named John Zick, who, like Rob Peast, was missing. It was just the beginning. Through interviews with Gacy's acquaintances, it was discovered that two employees of Gacy's were also missing. Gregory Godzik and Johnny Butkovich, both 17 years old, both had not been heard from for at least two years. An unmistakable pattern began to emerge, linking Gacy to missing boys. So it, it was as if a trickle had started and now all of a sudden it's turned into a waterfall. It was then that the investigators got two final breaks. First, a fellow employee of Rob Peast revealed that she had put her photo receipt in Peast's jacket. That receipt was the same one found in Gacy's house. It provided a critical link, proving that John Gacy had contact with Rob Peast the night Rob disappeared. And there was more. Interviews with Gacy's employees revealed they had been asked by Gacy to dig trenches for new plumbing in the crawl space beneath the house. The story triggered a memory for a detective who had once used the bathroom in Gacy's house. Mind you again, it's cold winter, and the furnace came up from bringing the fumes up from downstairs. Now, being an experienced homicide detective and detective, Schultz came back and said that he recognized the odor of bodies decaying. Bodies in the basement. It was an appalling idea that haunted detectives, some of whom had actually spent several hours inside Gacy's home in the rec room, just above the basement. Gacy himself had invited the detectives inside for drinks, perhaps out of arrogance, perhaps in an effort to taunt them. Based on these new clues, detectives pushed for a second search warrant. Then, late in the evening of December 20th, they followed Gacy to his attorney's office. We were absolutely certain that at this point there was a confession because the attorneys were 
very, very, very nervous. After spending the night on the couch at his attorney's office, Gacy was on the move. The exhausted detectives had followed him for eight days. Christmas was just four days away. And finally, they believed Gacy was going to crack. This was um, the beginning of the end for Gacy. He had apparently decided that he was uh, going to commit suicide and uh, was going to go around and say his last goodbyes. One of Gacy's first stops was the Shell gas station, where he was a regular customer. At that point, I go in the gas station. Um, I recovered some uh, drugs that Gacy had given to these people as he was saying his last goodbyes. When I got that information, um, I told them to, t to take him down, to arrest him. Um, and uh, it, that was probably the closing of the noose. We rushed the car at a stoplight, pulled Gacy out of the car, threw him up uh, against the trunk of the car, and told him that he was under arrest for a drug violation. By December 21st, just 10 days after Rob Peace disappeared, John Wayne Gacy was headed for jail on a drug charge. He was connected to several missing boys, but not a single body had been found. As Gacy was led into the station, a second search of his house was just moments away. When Crime Stories continues. By the spring of 1992, the Menard State Penitentiary in downstate Illinois had been John Wayne Gacy's home for 13 years. And so, by the time he agreed to be interviewed, he had an answer for everything. Even when he was asked about the odor from the crawl space, Gacy had an explanation. You know, I found it as odd when we bought the house that a house with a crawl space would need a sump pump. But then I learned the first time it rained that this ground gets wet under there and then the crawl space actually floods up to a foot deep in water and then as it recedes it puts out a musty odor there was always a musty, musty odor in that house as for the day in december 1978 when a police detective thought he smelled decaying bodies gacy said it wasn't that at all we had come into the house and my little lasa opso was in the house and of course he had been locked in the kitchen you know all day well a little puppy he piddles See, and, and while he's piddling and while he is uh, doing his business on the paper and that, you can imagine what it smells like if you go into a closed room and when the heat came on. Still today, it seems inconceivable that Gacy would rely on such a defense. Because the truth about the crawl space became international news on the very day Gacy was arrested. On the night of December 21st, 1978, while John Gacy was held at the Des Plaines police station for possession of marijuana, the second search of his house began. While some officers looked for evidence upstairs, two went below into the crawl space. Moving on hands and knees, the evidence technician surveyed the muddy ground. One officer took a shovel, dug down about six inches, and pulled up something hard. It was a human bone. While held at a local police station, Gacy complained of chest pains and was rushed to a nearby hospital. Detective David Hackmeister met him there. I hadn't been there maybe 20 minutes or a half an hour when I got a phone call uh, from my supervisor advising that they had found bones in the crawl space. Uh, at that time, Gacy was just being released from Holy Family Hospital, uh, and I advised him at that point that he was under arrest for murder. Defeated, Gacy looked straight at Hackmeister and said, Dave, I'm ready to clear the air. He then confessed to the murder of more than 30 young men and boys. He certainly held nothing back. He talked about the very first person that he killed uh, and that he, um, he had stabbed him to death and that caused such a mess that he had to come up with another plan after that. Every person that he killed thereafter he came up with a plan to strangle. The specifics Gacy provided of torture in his house were staggering. He talked in detail about sexually abusing the boys and strangling them. As Gacy talked, the officers looked for some feeling in him, some emotion about what he had done. There was none. In the confession room, I most clearly remember that uh, there was no remorse. Very, very cold about it. 
By the next day, word that bodies had been found at John Gacy's house had spread through the media. The Cook County Medical Examiner, Dr. Robert Stein, arrived and joined the crew to direct the exhuming of the bodies. First, they ripped out the floorboards of the house, exposing the crawl space completely. Some workers dug through the mud beneath the house. Others began to dismantle the garage. By midday, the first body bag emerged. The crew pressed on. A second body was carried out shortly after. On that first day, a ritual was established that would last as long as the digging continued. Each afternoon, Dr. Stein would report the discoveries of the day. In the garage, there was just that one skeletalized remain, and in the house itself also a skeletalized remain. No one knew how many bodies would eventually be found, but based on Gacy's confession, officials speculated that the number would be considerable. When this whole thing is over, you might be witnessing one of the most horrible crimes, perhaps, in a century. Early on, investigators brought in the one person who could provide the most help, John Gacy. He showed them one spot to check and then was quickly whisked away. Gacy's information about the graveyard beneath his house was remarkably precise. At one point, he even drew a sketch of the crawl space. To this day, it's a bone-chilling little handwritten sketch because this guy knew where almost everybody was. He didn't remember the names of them, or he wouldn't tell us the names, but he knew where they were in the basement. All six bodies were essentially skeletalized. For those working in the crawl space, the job was horrendous. Each time they dug a hole, it would immediately fill with water. They would sort through the mud by hand, picking up small bones. Whenever they found a skull, they placed a stake into the ground with an identifying number. Outside in the freezing cold, among the spectators was veteran crime reporter John Drummond. It attracted the curious, despite the cold weather, come, people would come out there to see the scene because what, what had ever this scene ever happened before? No. The odor was terrible. All the in investigators that we talked to afterwards admitted that the stench, despite the fact it was very cold uh, weather, was overwhelming. It was terrible in there. The smell of death was everywhere as they went in there. Some people came not just out of curiosity. They were relatives of young men who were missing. I just have a grandson missing, and it's just a stab in the dark. The number of bodies found today are six. Bringing the total to? 21. In the final stages of the search, the Gacy house was completely dismantled. 29 bodies had been unearthed. But nowhere had they found Rob Peast, the young boy whose disappearance had initiated the investigation of John Wayne Gacy. The search for him would continue. At uh, this point in time, <clears throat> it would appear that uh, we have uh, uh, removed uh, those bodies from the crawl space. As the search for bodies ended, there was one question the stunned public wanted answered. How had John Gacy gotten away with killing so many young men and boys for so many years? Behind the mask of the killer clown when Crime Stories returns. In 1992, in his television interview from prison, John Gacy presented himself to the public as a man deeply concerned with the breakdown of family values. Do you realize by 1993 that 50% uh, of the American families will be single parented? And that shows a breakdown in the church and not being able to hold families together. And for this reason, children run away from home and seek love in other places. Twice divorced himself, he still claimed to live his own life according to very strict standards. Uh, I've always uh, looked after my children, even now. A lot of things that my dad did, I, I refused to do, because I, I don't see, I don't believe in hitting, hitting children. A good father, a concerned and, uh, citizen. He said he was also a dedicated community servant. I always felt that service community and community service to others, you know, in my religious background, I felt if you serve other people, it, it'll come back to serve you. Ironically, for people who knew Gacy before his arrest, his statements were actually believable because the public life of John Gacy was that of a model citizen and loving father. 
As the bodies, one after another, were pulled from Gacy's house in December 1978, there was no group more stunned than the group of people who considered themselves Gacy's friends. I still find it hard to believe him. I've known the man four and a half years, and uh, I thought the world of him. To those who knew him, John Gacy was not only a successful businessman, he was also a good neighbor. Routinely, he opened his house for lavish holiday theme parties. But what many remembered about him most was that he often dressed up as a clown to entertain children. At the top of all, I mean, he used to, he used to do a lot of his terrible work. In other words, the guy was a clown. And he put on show, shows and all that, and the kids dirty, treated the kids real good and all that. But now, with the bodies being pulled from his basement, the world discovered another side to John Gacy. And suddenly, people wanted to know, who was this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Attorney Greg Adamski, who later represented Gacy, discovered Gacy operated by his own rules. Most of the things that all of us value, John had no value for at all. John, John didn't value other life. John didn't value other emotions. John didn't value any institutions. John didn't value the feelings of other people. John Gacy grew up in Chicago. His father was reportedly abusive, and he had some health problems as a child. He was close to his mother and only sister. In his adolescent years, Gacy loved to dress up in uniforms. He scored 118 on an IQ test which is in the bright normal range. He told doctors after his arrest that he committed his first murder when he was 15 years old and then couldn't stop. He made the statement in 1979 to the psychiatrist hired to help in his defense, Helen Morrison. He started the pattern of what later is described as almost an addiction to homicide. And that's so similar to someone who's an addict that They'll be doing all right, and then there's a certain point where they almost have a craving. And it's not that they're after a human being. It's not that they've had a fight with anyone. It's not that they've remembered some traumatic episode from their childhood. It's just that simple and that terrifying. Gacy was never charged with the murder he claimed to commit as a teen. And then in the 60s, he got married to a co-worker and went to work as a manager for a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant in Waterloo, Iowa. He became active in a local civic organization, the JCs, even named Man of the Year. Gacy had a young wife and children, but was developing a penchant for sex with young boys. In 1968, at age 26, he was convicted of sexually assaulting a teenage boy. He was sentenced to 10 years, but because he was such a model prisoner, he served only 18 months. Returning to Chicago, now divorced, he made a clean start, rejected his family, and became involved in Democratic Party politics, and was even photographed with then First Lady Rosalind Carter. He also married a childhood friend who had two young daughters of her own. In the early 70s, he began a small contracting business called PDM, Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance. Outwardly, Gacy maintained a life that appeared meticulously in order. But unusual stories about him occasionally surfaced, like this one from a young man Gacy picked up for a night of cruising in March 1978. I got in the car with him, and shortly after I got in the car with him, he placed a rag over my face, of which turned out to be chloroform, and proceeded to have a lengthy drive, and every time I would come to, the rag would go back over my face, and I remember him carrying me into his house, and. Then he put the rag over me, and that's the last thing I remembered until I found myself about 5, 5.30 in the morning on the steps right by Lincoln Park, half-dressed, my face completely burned. Another young man described a night of torture to then-state's attorney, Terry Sullivan. He made him take his clothes off and tortured him with candles in one room, then filled the bathtub and would take him from the floor of the one room into the bathroom and shove his head under water uh, for excruciating long periods of time to the point where this kid passed out a couple of times. It's amazing he didn't die at that particular time. Neither story was believed, dismissed by police as lovers' quarrels. John Gacy's public persona never changed 
until the day the bodies were found and Gacy's real story became a national news story, shocking even veteran crime reporters. I did, could not understand how a man living in the city of Chicago, who was respected apparently by neighbors, active politically, could be responsible for doing something like this. To this day, it defies logic how he was able to get kill 33 people and bury them, most of them on his property and get away with it for a number of years. Later, it was learned that Gacy began burying the bodies under his house in 1972. By 1978, he believed the crawl space was full and found another way to dispose of his victims. After his arrest, he took police to a bridge over the Des Plaines River. Eventually, four more bodies were recovered. The last one, found in the spring, was Rob Peast, the boy whose disappearance had led police to Gacy. In April 1979, John Gacy was indicted for the murder of 33 young men and boys, the largest number of murders ever charged to one person in U.S. history. Gacy's ploy to lure his victims, when we continue on Crime Stories. Of all the statements John Gacy made during his 1992 interview from prison, the most chilling were those he made about his victims and their families. His contempt for them was obvious. That one mother that gets on television all the time who thinks I should be uh, given 33 injections, I think she ought to take 33 Valiums and go lay down. She goes on Geraldo's show and all these other shows talking about, uh, I think it's Maori, I think is the name. Her marine son, her marine son, if her marine son was so great, what the hell did he run away from home 12 times? From the beginning, Gacy's victims were known as numbers that represented nothing more than the sequence in which they had been found. From the crawl space, they were taken to the county morgue where the real work began, the job of identifying each body, changing the number to a name. The first body found turned out to be 17-year-old Johnny Butkovich one of the boys who had worked for Gacy. The second was Greg Godzik, also an employee. As each name was announced, television crews raced to find the families. He was a good boy. I, I'd spend anything to find him. I really would, and I think every mother would. It's just not me. I'm sorry for everybody else. Daryl Sampson, John Zick, Randall Reffitt. The faces filled the newspapers. Body number 13 was Johnny Mowry, 19 years old, a former Marine. His mother, Dolores Nieder, last saw Johnny on September 15, 1977. We would go out searching for him. We were playing detectives. We were searching for Johnny, looking, and already Johnny was dead. Dolores Nieder went to the police and reported her son missing. They were not helpful. He said, no, he said, Johnny's a runaway. Oh, I was shocked when I heard that. I said, what has Johnny got to run away from? It was the same with all the others. Not a single parent was believed. And for years, some police officers unwittingly played right into Gacy's hands. And what he said to us, nothing wrong with Johnny, Johnny's not dead. What made He's you missing. That's all what he say. He's, he's run away. And, and, uh, and uh, I know right away it's not true. Because Johnny no got no reason to run away. If they listen to us, they save so many, so many lives. While the police claimed they were runaways, Gacy said they were all homosexual predators. The biggest excuse that he came up with is that all of the victims made him do what he did. It was the victim's fault if they hadn't pursued him, he wouldn't have had to do to them what he did. But as investigators discovered the identities of the boys, it was clear that the majority were neither runaways nor male prostitutes. Gacy had said they were gay. Johnny, I know, was not gay. But even if he was, no one has a right to take anyone's life. As more bodies were identified, the names kept coming. William Carroll, Robert Gilroy, Russell Nelson. They were all young, 
healthy, strong. How had Gacy managed to overpower the boys? The answer, Gacy was cunning, and he had a perfect ploy. In his black car, equipped with two spotlights, Gacy pretended to be a policeman. He would stop a boy walking down the street, flash a badge, and tell him to get in. Once inside the car, the boys were driven to Gacy's home. All he needed then was a good trick. He told officers how it worked with his last victim, Rob Peace. He says, now, it's a very simple trick. He says, I'll show you how to do it. Put the handcuffs on. So he had Rob Peace actually put the handcuffs on himself, and cuff himself behind his back. And Rob struggled with the handcuffs for several minutes and said, well, what's the trick here? And John reached into his breast pocket and pulled out the key to the handcuffs and said, the trick is you have to have the key. With the boys restrained in the handcuffs, Gacy then moved on to his rope trick. Slipping a rope over the victim's neck and twisting a rod through it over and over until the young man collapsed. For the parents who heard the stories of their children's last moments, the image was horrifying. I could never forgive Gacy for the rest of my life. How on earth can you forgive someone who takes a loving child from you and who does it in such, oh, a tragic way. Over a period of six years, John Gacy murdered at least 33 boys and was never discovered until finally the police listened to the parents of one child. Believe me, if Rob Peast had been anyone but Rob Peast, if he had been a, a person that had run away on several occasions, um, we probably wouldn't have looked into it as closely as we had. In the spring, four months after he disappeared, Rob Peast, the boy who stopped John Gacy, was buried. Nine other boys killed by Gacy were never identified and were buried in separate cemeteries around Chicago. And although the young victims have all now been properly laid to rest, the pain for the families is still very much alive. Losing a child is just the hardest thing in life that you have to go through. Gacy pleads insanity, but will the jury believe it when we continue on Crime Stories? As John Gacy spoke from prison in 1992, he made it very clear that he was tired of being associated with other famous serial killers especially the man who killed and then consumed his victims, Jeffrey Dahmer. I'll tell you this, that's a good example as to why insanity doesn't belong in the courtroom. Because if Jeffrey Dahmer doesn't meet the, the requirements for insanity, then I'd hate like hell to run into the guy that does. It is an ironic statement, coming from a man who 13 years before had pled not guilty to 33 murders, using the defense of insanity. On February 6th, 1980, the first day of John Gacy's trial, people lined up at the criminal court building in Chicago, eager to get a glimpse of one of the most notorious serial killers of all time. Already, Gacy's story had received so much press coverage in Chicago that jurors had to be selected from Rockford, a city 50 miles north. The 16 men and women were bused to the courthouse and sequestered for the entire six-week-long trial. Gacy was pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. And at first, it seemed the defense had an advantage. The judge was Louis Garippo. If you really think about it, if the defense is insanity, and you have someone who's killed 33 people, everyone say, hey, there must be something wrong with that person. And I believe that in most, uh, uh, more than half of the jurors that were selected, uh, felt that there was something mentally wrong with uh, John Gacy. In their opening statements, attorneys for the prosecution argued that Gacy was evil. They displayed photographs of his victims on a board, nicknamed the Gallery of Grief. They promised to show that the murders of the young men were thoughtful, rational, and premeditated. The defense described Gacy as impulsive, deranged, a profoundly sick man who collected bodies like souvenirs. 
the question the jury had to decide was Gacy crazy or evil? For the defense, a battery of experts testified that Gacy fit the standard of insanity. One was forensic psychiatrist Helen Morrison. He could commit an act, but it didn't mean that he sat and planned the act. It was almost as if he were an automaton doing this behavior, and once the behavior was done, he was finished. The psychiatric experts offered varying opinions of Gacy's mental illness, borderline personality, paranoid schizophrenia, amnesia. But the prosecution believed the facts of the case were more important than the psychiatric testimony. If the murders were not premeditated, they asked, why would Gacy have burial trenches dug in advance? Why did he keep handcuffs and a rope ready? If he didn't understand the criminality of his behavior, why would he deliberately choose victims who might not be missed? If he had amnesia, how could he draw a precise sketch locating each body? William Kunkel was the chief prosecutor. Clearly, when you have this kind of intentional behavior, the pre-planning for all those things, the covering up, the post-planning, the post-conduct for all those things, and all this going on in the backdrop of what on the surface appears to be a perfectly normal existence just doesn't fit. As the jury heard the testimony and looked at Gacy, they saw a man at ease and very much in control of himself. The theory or the thought or the fantasy about someone who's insane is that they're running down the street screaming, pulling their hair out without clothes on. And they could clearly see that he was not insane. I mean, he was sitting in the courtroom, he was participating, smiling, being uh, considerate of where people were sitting. The jury also learned that Gacy ran a successful business, was involved in politics, and was active in his community. All rare accomplishments for someone truly mentally ill. A real medical model psychiatrist that really treats patients and understands mental illness will never believe that you can turn this kind of serious mental illness off like a faucet. Did he have personality disorders? Absolutely. Was he a sexual deviant? Of course, but uh, psychotic, not even close. Throughout the trial, Gacy remained confident, certain that he would win the case. He had been in the back and he was reading the Chicago Sun-Times and some of the ads in there, and he had torn out a page and he had circled a party, a St. Patrick's Day party, uh, that was to be coming up. And he had the bailiff give it to me on the table, and he said, I'll see you there. But then, toward the end of the trial, there was testimony that the defense believed was a final blow against Gacy. At that time, there was a psychiatrist who testified that if he was found insane, he would be put out on the street because he could not be hospitalized against his will. That, obviously, no one in their right mind believed that this man was sane. But no one was willing to take the chance that he would be out on the street. The last dramatic argument came from William Kunkel. I said to the jury, I said, uh, well, if you want to show mercy, and then I just stopped in mid-sentence. I turned around and I walked over to the victim board, and real slow, I ripped each photo off the board with a loud snap. Take my time, about two minutes, to get all 22 off in my hand. And I walked back in front of the jury box right in their faces. And I said, look, if you want to show this man mercy, you show him the same mercy he showed when he took these 22 lives off the face of the earth and put them here. And I just threw them in the crawl space opening, walked away. I left a couple of minutes of pin drop silence in the courtroom. And it was, that was a good point. The jury took only one vote and unanimously agreed to find John Gacy guilty of 33 counts of murder the next day, they sentenced him to death. Gacy deals from death row when Crime Stories continues. Throughout the many years he spent in prison, convicted serial killer John Gacy had little trouble keeping busy. He spent much of his time painting. This is Christ as I see him in myself. And it's monolithic because Christ, to me, is monolithic. He, he's all things to all people. This here is the, uh, the Hi-Ho series. This is called Hi-Ho Around the Campfire. Many who knew him there said Gacy actually enjoyed prison. 
He thrived on the regularity of life in an institution. Karen Conti was one of his appellate attorneys. His life outside of prison was just completely uh, filled with anxiety for him. He had options. He, he could kill, he could not kill. There, were these, this, there was this good and bad that was a constant dilemma in his life. When he was in prison, all of that was removed. He had his life set up in a very orderly fashion. If you want to know what my life is like, I log it every day. For the last 12 years, all you got to do is ask. I can tell you everything. I can tell you it's the first meal they serve me here because I do it daily. What do you do all day? Every phone call, everything that I do, every time an officer is around me is logged. Every movement that I make is in the book here. Filling the pages of Gacy's log were hundreds of hours spent with attorneys who were representing him in the appellate courts. As ardent opponents of the death penalty, working together, they had taken on one of the most unpopular cases in the country. First of all, we got death threats. Uh, we, we had clients who quit us. Um, uh, became, we carried a baseball bat from the garage to the house after a while. We had bomb threats. Dozens of legal issues were raised on behalf of Gacy, while he maintained that he was not the one who killed the boys in his basement. At the time of my arrest, uh, there was f four other suspects, all employees of PDM contractors, all with keys to the house. To the end, Gacy denied his guilt. I wanted him to have this breakthrough. I wanted him to have this, this all of a sudden, all right, there's no more pretense, there are no more appeals. Now I can tell you I did it, and this is why I did it. I was waiting for it, but it, it just never came. It was like a, a book with no ending. As the years went by, each and every appeal was denied. At last, a final execution date was set. May 10, 1994, 14 years after his conviction. There was nothing, nothing was going to delay the killing of John Gacy because the people were bound and determined that John Gacy was going to be killed. Throughout the years on death row, Gacy claimed that he was not worried. He had no reason to fear the day he would die. If you believe you've lived your life the right way, then you do not have nothing to fear in my case. You're not worried about facing God? No. I'm fairly comfortable with him. I've been a, the, uh, at the Catholic services. I'm the server for the priest for the last 10 years. I have no qualms about doing that. I've had confession, I have communion, and, and I, I am at peace with myself. On the morning of his execution, Gacy was flown from his downstate prison to the death chamber at Stateville Correctional Center. We have attorneys on standby that will be available to the very end to uh, fight any attempts to stay this execution. By 7 that evening, the U.S. Supreme Court denied a last request for a stay of execution. At the end, Gacy wanted to speak with each of the lawyers separately. He took me aside and he wanted to thank me for trying as hard as I could and for keeping him uh, um, occupied with jokes and, and for, for being kind to him and calling him and keeping him informed. Even while the crowds cheered outside his cell, Gacy did not believe he was going to die. At about 11.15 on the night that Gacy was killed, one of us called up Gacy and said, how are you doing? And Gacy said, you know what, can, I, can this wait? Can I talk to you in a while? We said, no, John, I can't wait. I mean, what do you, what do you mean a while? He said, call back in an hour or two. I said, John, you're going to be dead in an hour or two. What are you thinking about? There was a candlelight vigil by opponents of the death penalty. But far more people clearly were in favor of his execution. Just after midnight, with relatives of his victims watching on a television in the prison basement, Gacy was strapped to a gurney in the execution room he was given three lethal injections. John Wayne Gacy was pronounced dead at 12.58 uh, uh, a.m. He got a much easier death than any of his victims. In my opinion, he got an easier death than he deserved. But the important thing is that he paid for his crimes with his life. A few months after Gacy's execution, a ceremony was organized. Relatives of the boys who were killed were invited to take a painting by Gacy and burn it. It was nothing more than a symbolic gesture, but for many, it seemed to fulfill a goal. To rid the world once and for all of the grisly horror that John Wayne Gacy had created.
For obvious reasons, many people would prefer to forget John Wayne Gacy. But there is value, perhaps, in keeping the name of this brutal killer alive. The story of the outwardly friendly Gacy provides a timeless lesson that evil can take on many disguises. It may be your next door neighbor, it may be a co-worker, or it may be the man dressed as a clown. For Crime Stories, I'm Richard Belzer.